he met the literary artists of the day. Profiting by their advice and inspired by their encouragement, he launched upon a career that emblazoned his name across the sky. His home, Griba Castle, on the Isle of Man, became a mecca for tourists from the far corners of the world, and he left a multi-million dollar estate. Yet, who knows, he might have died poor and unknown had he not written an essay expressing his admiration for a famous man. Such is the power, the stupendous power, of sincere heartfelt appreciation. Rossetti considered himself important. That is not strange. Almost everyone considers himself important, very important. The life of many a person could probably be changed if only someone would make him feel important. Ronald J. Rowland, who is one of the instructors of our course in California, is also a teacher of arts and crafts. He wrote to us about a student named Chris in his beginning crafts class. Chris was a very quiet, shy boy lacking in self-confidence, the kind of student that often does not receive the attention he deserves. I also teach an advanced class that had grown to be somewhat of a status symbol and a privilege for a student to have earned the right to be in it. On Wednesday, Chris was diligently working at his desk. I really felt there was a hidden fire deep inside him. I asked Chris if he would like to be in the advanced class. How I wish I could express the look in Chris's face, the emotions in that shy 14-year-old boy, trying to hold back his tears. Who me, Mr. Roland? Am I good enough? Yes, Chris, you are good enough. I had to leave at that point because tears were coming to my eyes. As Chris walked out of class that day, seemingly two inches taller, he looked at me with bright blue eyes and said in a positive voice, Thank you, Mr. Roland. Chris taught me a lesson I will never forget our deep desire to feel important. To help me never forget this rule, I made a sign which reads, You are important. This sign hangs in the front of the classroom for all to see and to remind me that each student I face is equally important. The unvarnished truth is that almost all the people you meet feel themselves superior to you in some way, and a sure way to their hearts is to let them realize in some subtle way that you realize their importance, and recognize it sincerely. Remember what Emerson said, every man I meet is my superior in some way. In that, I learn of him. And the pathetic part of it is that frequently those who have the least justification for a feeling of achievement bolster up their egos by a show of tumult and conceit which is truly nauseating. As Shakespeare put it, man, proud man, slash drayest in a little brief authority, forward slash. Plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven slash as make the angels weep. I am going to tell you how business people in my own courses have applied these principles with remarkable results. Let's take the case of a Connecticut attorney, because of his relatives he prefers not to have his name mentioned. Shortly after joining the course, Mr. R. drove to Long Island with his wife to visit some of her relatives. She left him to chat with an old aunt of hers and then rushed off by herself to visit some of the younger relatives. Since he soon had to give a speech professionally on how he applied the principles of appreciation, he thought he would gain some worthwhile experience talking with the elderly lady. So he looked around the house to see what he could honestly admire. This house was built about 1890, wasn't it? he inquired. Yes, she replied, that is precisely the year it was built. It reminds me of the house I was born in, he said. It's beautiful. Well built. Roomy. You know, they don't build houses like this anymore. You're right, the old lady agreed. The young folks nowadays don't care for beautiful homes. All they want is a small apartment, and then they go gaddying about in their automobiles. This is a dream house, she said in a voice vibrating with tender memories. This house was built with love. My husband and I dreamed about it for years before we built it. We didn't have an architect. We planned it all as elves. She showed Mr. R. about the house, and he expressed his hearty admiration for the beautiful treasures she had picked up in her travels and cherished over a lifetime, paisley shawls, an old English tea set, Wedgwood china, French beds and chairs, Italian paintings, and silk draperies that had once hung in a French chateau. 
after showing Mr. R. through the house, she took him out to the garage. There, jacked up on blocks, was a Packard car, in mint condition. My husband bought that car for me shortly before he passed on, she said softly. I have never ridden in it since his death. You appreciate nice things, and I'm going to give this car to you. Why, auntie, he said, you overwhelm me. I appreciate your generosity, of course, but I couldn't possibly accept it. I'm not even a relative of yours. I have a new car, and you have many relatives that would like to have that Packard. Relatives, she exclaimed. Yes, I have relatives who are just waiting till I die so they can get that car. But they are not going to get it. If you don't want to give it to them, you can very easily sell it to a second-hand dealer, he told her. Sell it, she cried. Do you think I would sell this car? Do you think I could stand to see strangers riding up and down the street in that car, that car that my husband bought for me? I wouldn't dream of selling it. I'm going to give it to you. You appreciate beautiful things. He tried to get out of accepting the car, but he couldn't without hurting her feelings. This lady, left all alone in a big house with her paisley shawls, her French antiques, and her memories, was starving for a little recognition. She had once been young and beautiful and sought after. She had once built a house warm with love and had collected things from all over Europe to make it beautiful. Now, in the isolated loneliness of old age, she craved a little human warmth, a little genuine appreciation, and no one gave it to her. And when she found it, like a spring in the desert, her gratitude couldn't adequately express itself with anything less than the gift of her cherished Packard. Let's take another case, Donald M. McMahon, who was superintendent of Lewis and Valentine, nurserymen and landscape architects in Rye, New York, related this incident, shortly after I attended the talk on how to win friends and influence people, I was landscaping the estate of a famous attorney. The owner came out to give me a few instructions about where he wished to plant a mass of rhododendrons and azaleas. I said, Judge, you have a lovely hobby. I've been admiring your beautiful dogs. I understand you win a lot of blue ribbons every year at the show in Madison Square Garden. The effect of this little expression of appreciation was striking. Yes, the judge replied, I do have a lot of fun with my dogs. Would you like to see my kennel? He spent almost an hour showing me his dogs and the prizes they had won. He even brought out their pedigrees and explained about the bloodlines responsible for such beauty and intelligence. Finally, turning to me, he asked, do you have any small children? Yes, I do, I replied, I have a son. Well, wouldn't he like a puppy, the judge inquired. Oh, yes, he'd be tickled pink. All right, I'm going to give him one, the judge announced. He started to tell me how to feed the puppy. Then he paused. You'll forget it if I tell you. I'll.